Hey everybody, one of the Throwback Thursday GMG review. Today we're taking a look at Battletech, a game of armored combat from FASA Corporation. This was published in 1985, and yes, it is the first edition of Battletech. Now people will argue with me in the comments, it's not, but it is, because the first, first edition of Battletech, the zero edition as I would call it, is Battle Droids. It was in 1984 and they hurriedly had to rename it after somebody took legal objection to the use of the term droids um, and it was rebranded as Battletech. Of course, that was then trademarked, you can see with the big TM, uh, and has been pretty much the exact same, uh, you know, sort of like trademark name. Uh, and even that font has been the same for almost 40 years. So from 85 until now, uh, we're looking at the Game of Armor Combat being almost the same. And you can see right here, this is the current one. So these are both from the um, starter set. Uh, now, back then, Battletech Game of Armor Combat was pretty much a cardboard and paper game. Uh, FASA Corporation eventually acquired Ralpartha, um, a miniature company of the time, um, to do a series of robots in their series called Minifigs, um, based on the artwork from the game. But the game itself, and unfortunately, I don't have the box for this. I got this copy of the Core Rules from 85 in this, which was its first expansion, Battletech Reinforcements. This was more stuff to play Battletech with. Whoever owned this previously, I found this at a flea market. Uh, his, the, the guy's name was, he didn't write it in here, he wrote it in the other thing. Uh, his name was Martin Evans. Thank you, Martin Evans, for this treasure trove of Battletech stuff that I managed to get my hands on. What he did was he combined all of his Battletech stuff into this single reinforcements box. And you can see here, uh, this is the data sheets for everything. So it gives you 55 more profiles for Battle Max. There's 14 in this right here, although they're not individually sort of like sourced, they're just kind of classified. Um, all of the cardboards, so this, this is the actual stuff that came with this. So this cardboard, the reinforcements would have come in this box, the cardboard um, mats, which are like actually a hard card and they're in relatively decent shape for being 40 years old. He put his name on everything. He literally initialed all of his standees too. Um, they would have been played on this, which would have also come in the Game of Armored Combat box. And you would have played with these standees and he meticulously named all of these. Now these are from the reinforcements, but the ones that would have come in the original core game would have been these guys. Uh, like this, like the Locust. And you can see here the standees had a front and back, so you actually knew where your mechs were facing, and you played on like an old Avon Hill game, you played on these hex boards with these original things. Now, to know what side you were playing on, you were given additional tokens that had the symbols of all of the uh, factions. So that's House Steiner. So this Marauder has a House Steiner thing, so you knew this was the House Steiner one. Because if you're using the same standee, like another Marauder, um, and you, you couldn't, you couldn't tell them apart. <laughs> so you needed to like, you need to have a way of knowing this was a Marauder one that was Steiner versus the ones that were, let's say, oh, I don't know, an Aridani Light Horse Locust. <laughs> um, and so that was what the core game came with. It came with tons of these faction markers for the uh, houses. And then you had all of your, and look at that, that is, uh, Unseen to say the least, that guy is definitely a Robotech Valkyrie. And then you had these little foot standees to put them in, and they would slide in the side so that they would stand up on the table. <laughs> it's definitely a Valkyrie. Uh, there's another one. There's another Valkyrie right there. I think that's supposed to be the Crusader, maybe, or the Wasp. The oldest ones don't have names. That's the Crusader right there. The oldest ones don't actually have names on them, they just have the pictures, and you couldn't tell which ones are part. So the ones that had name on them were from the reinforcement box. The ones without the names are from the uh, the original core box. Uh, and yeah, you can see why later on they also got in a little trouble for the mech designs, because they thought they were in the right and that they'd, they'd paid for them, but apparently the people who sold them to them didn't have the right to actually sell them. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, and so you got that, uh, as uh, this was all just sort of like combined in the same box. Uh, and so I managed to get my hands on this core rule book and I figured it'd be fun to do kind of a page by page flip across of the current Game of Armor Combat rule book with the one that came in the box in 84 and have a look at what's different and what's changed. So game components, you get battle mech figures, uh, in card, you can see Martin's named his rule book too. 
um, and your training sheets. Now you get an example mech in here to play with. It's called the Chameleon. Although you never got standees for it. Uh, and this is a blank sheet for making your own mechs. It defines all the components that come in here, like all of your cardboard counters you got for terrain. So open ground, cliffs, light woods, heavy woods, water. Uh, in this one, you've got your box contents on the first sheet as well. So you see here, what'd you get in this? Plastic miniatures, record sheets, mech warrior cards, Battletech rule books, Battletech primers, punch board, eye storm, table cut, which is a short story, tables card, dice, playing maps, and alpha strike guards. In this one, you get a train map sheet, uh, you get your training sheets, and then you get the, uh, the battle mech components. And what's really interesting is this 48 page rule book is not that different from the rules in here. The rules of maybe like a 3% rule shift over 40 years. Uh, the mech record sheet has a breakdown. There's, I think, a few more pages in this one. This one's almost 60 pages, 56 pages. Playing the game, your sequence, so initiative, movement, heat, combat, and ending the game. Uh, the, in this, so in this edition, one of the big differences was, so obviously initiative, you roll 2d6, he goes first. Movement phase, the player who lost the initiative moves his mech using the movement rules in the train map sheet, hex by hex. The player who won the initiative moves his mech, he has the advantage and he can see where his opponent's already moved. The heat phase, if the heat mech ran or jumped, the resulting heat is subtracted from the number of heat sinks uh, that you have left undamaged. At the beginning of the game, each chameleon has 10 heat sinks. In this game, you gain, in, in the new edition, you'd gain heat. So there's one of the key changes, I guess, between the first edition, second edition, the, the, the 1.1 edition, um, and the current edition of the rules is you gain heat in Battletech. In this one, you would cross off heat sinks. It's the same thing, it's just a terminology thing. Um, and number five, if the mech is standing in depth one or deeper water, the amount of heat that it can get rid of is increased according to the heat rules. The total is a uh, number of heat points that may be created by firing weapons. Combat phase, the player who lost the initiative declares and fires first. He can only use weapons for which he has heat points. The player who won the initiative declares any attacks he plans is making him the advantage. Uh, combat occurs simultaneously and any damage given by the accessible attack does not take effect until after all combat's finished. So same as now. It does not matter who completes his fire first, but all of one player's fire should be completed before somebody else does the others. And then damage is recorded in the chameleon training sheet. End the game. Repeat steps one through eight until only one player's mech is left. The game ends when both one uh, player has one mech left. And then skills. You have gunnery, uh, sorry, pilot rating of five and a gunnery of four. Those are your two mech warrior skills. And then here's your training table of contents. So that was like a quick, a quick start. All right, look at this. Here we go. So facing and movement, almost exactly the same. Where your battle mech's facing and how it can move. It looks like a rifleman on that one. And I think this picture is actually identical. Move allowed, move not allowed, move not allowed, not allowed, not allowed, move allowed. So fronts and backs. So absolutely identical, those two diagrams, which I think is great. Uh, how you change facing. And then on these side panels, you got all of your, um, your history and background. So what's interesting is the timeline for this book is the Succession Wars. So it's, it's before the clans invade. The clans don't exist yet. There's no actual clan invasion. Uh, it hasn't happened. We don't know about the clans. And all we know is that at the breaking up of the Star League, there's going to be a bunch of different infighting between the various factions in the Inner Sphere. And here they are. Uh, so movement rules. So we're on to movement rules again. So there you go. So terrain hexagons. So clear, light woods, heavy woods. Uh, I think it's in the movement section here. And how far you can move in terrain. Terrain cost tables. Yep. So clear, light woods, heavy woods, water, water, and elevation changes. There was no rules for paved roads. Uh, and that's about it. <laughs> it's all the same. Running, so what it costs you to run. Falling down, making a piloting skill check. Piloting takes over 20 points of damage. Oh, let's just see if they're still in here for piloting skill. Standing up, combat. I think piloting skill checks just come later in the rule book in this one. Combat, 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 combat. Damage. Heat. Other actions. Piloting skill rolls. PSR, here you go. So it has its own section on page 40 in this one. And it's if you take 20 points of damage, enter depth one water, <laughs> leave depth two water, enter leave depth three water, try to get up, or try to avoid falling damage. Yeah, it's all exactly the same. So if you were to enter the water, 
Enter depth three plus water x plus one, still the same, none for depth two, minus one for depth one. Exactly the same rules now, almost 40 years later. Uh, we're into like where the human sphere is and the different warlords that are fighting. You're facing after a fall, is it the same? And facing after a fall, one, same direction, on face. <laughs> two, hex side, on side. Yeah, right side, right side, left side, left side. It's exactly the same, the facing table after falling. <laughs> I love this. I, I love that this is happening. So building up heat. Different activities can build up heat. You cross up your heat sinks. Walking zero, sorry, walking is plus one per turn. Running is plus two per turn. Jumping is plus one per hex minimum of three. Falling is none. Dropping to the ground is none. Standing up is plus one. A mech gets rid of heat automatically with its heat sinks. These are cooling devices that pass up heat. For each heat sink that's working, uh, the meat can get rid of one point of heat. When undamaged chameleon has 10 or more heat sinks, the mech gets rid of 10 heat points. Because weapons are fired after movement, this means the mech warrior usually cannot fire all his weapons in battle mech training, and so the battle mech trainee must choose the weapons to fire that will best use the heat points left after movement. Uh, water's cool you much more efficiently. If the mech is standing in water that covers some of its heat sinks, it can get rid of them. So if you're in shallow water, it uh, does nothing. If you're in a depth one water, then any heat sinks in your legs. Uh, depth two water or deeper will get rid of the extra heat from all the heat sinks, no matter where they're located. So basically, you get an extra. They double that. They become double heat sinks if you're in water. All right, here you're into like your house Davian, house Karita, house Steiner. Combat. All right, we're back to combat. Let's see what's what's what kind of diagrams we can find that are the exact same. Uh, Combat, all right. Uh, line of fire, where you can see. Yeah, so there's a diagram for line of sight, where your front facing is. Ranges, this is just examples for the, on the training Mac, firing your weapons, base to hit number. So short range is four, medium is six, long is eight, and then you add your piloting skill, or your, uh, so your gunnery skill. So if your gunnery skill four at short range, you'd be hitting on eights. Oh no, it's zero. I see, I see, I see. Sorry, this is the training one. Uh, first count the range between the attacking mech and the target. Use the shortest path. Next, consult the weapons table. The weapon being fired. Find the range in the low modifiers. The base hit number will be modified by training movement. Right, so it's plus two for medium range and plus four for long range. So if your skill was four, you're plus one, and then your additional plus one for having walked, plus two for having ran, and the number of hexes you move can increase it as well. Terrain modifiers for woods, where you get hit, left side, right side, front, and rear, and a critical table. Oh, I wonder if the critical table is exactly the same. Critical table, hit location table, okay. Left torso, critical, yep. Left leg, left arm, left arm, they're exactly the same. Center torso, right torso. I love the fact that like 99% of this so far is absolutely identical this many years later. Uh, the cluster hit table. Oh, it's, it comes later on. And then determining damage, how you apply damage to armor and then how it goes through and transfers damage to the internals. Yeah, and it's all the same. Advanced Gunnery uses all the components of the basic game. So that was the quick start rules. Now we're into the actual game setup for how you set up a game. Playing the game, battle mech lances, how to build a lance. Initiative, movement, reaction. Interesting. Oh, okay, so you have a reaction phase in this. I wonder if that still exists. For when you do your torso twist. So torso twist in this one, as part of your attack declaration, you torso twist. In the original version of the game, you'd roll for initiative like normal, then the person that loses moves a mech, and then you go back and forth moving them until um, they're all moved. Then the team that won the initiative twists the torso of its mechs one hex side either way if the player chooses to react to their opponent's movement. The team that lost the initiative chooses a mech and twists the torso, and then you go back and forth. Reaction twists alternate until all mechs have activated their torso twists. The team that lost the initiative is last to twist the torso. So basically, there's a torso twist reaction phase afterwards. So if you've moved around too much and you can't see anything anymore, you can, you can twist a little bit to try and be able to see. 
That's neat. I like that that's like its own little phase in this. I kind of wish that was still around. Like, it makes Torso Twist a bit more meaningful. Like, I get they shouldn't take up tons of the time, but there's something cool about that. And then you're into the reattack phase where you go back and forth shooting. Damage is resolved at the end. So first it's go back and forth shooting and then damage weapons just takes effect at the end. So there's no damage phase, there's like there's no end phase. It's the heat phase. Players just their heat skills reflect any heat buildup or loss during the game turn. Any temporary or permanent damage caused by excessive internal heat goes into effect. And then steps one through ten are repeated until only one team's battle max are left, and that, that's the winner. And then the piloting skill roll table, it's basically the same still. It's just repeated here again. Weapon combat. Oh, we're into some factions, mercenaries now. Hanson's Rough Riders, the Air Dandy Light Horse, Jay painted them. Uh, advanced Gunnery, picking a target. Pick a target in a shooting advanced gunnery is somewhat more difficult. Uh, in this game, there are more factors to consider. The firing of advanced gunnery table affects, uh, take advantage of the special nature of the arm mounted weapons. There's four basic arcs, the front and rear arcs and the right and left arc sides. Weapons mounted on the forward torso may only fire into the forward arc. Weapons mounted on the right arm uh, in the right hand uh, or in the right hand can fire into the forward arc or the right side. Weapons mounted on the rear torso can fire in the rear arc. Weapons mounted on the left arm can go in the forward arc or left side. So basically, you can shoot front with front guns, but then arms can go front left if they're left arms and front right if they're right arms. Interesting. Rotating your firing arcs, you can rotate one point if you're torso twisting. How to determine line of sight. I like these highlighted light woods. So basically, light woods uh, do not totally block line of sight hexes unless there's three more between mechs. So the way it works now is with line of sight, which are at the beginning of the combat thing, uh, it's woods, three or more points of intervening woods block line of sight. Light woods are worth one, heavy woods are worth two. They just made it a bit more granular, heavy woods if there's two or more in between. They have they have them stack in a way that makes sense now, uh, which is neat. But again, it's the same, it's the exact same rule, just kind of slightly updated uh, to make it more granular and modern. And the Wolf's Dragoons are over here. Firing weapons, multiple targets, so you get your penalties, and then you get a blank sheet. So you'll notice, one of the things in the blank sheets is there's no stats for the actual uh, gun, but you track your ammo and then your number and type of weapons are in here, and you had to copy everything down. So even the pre-made mechs in this game of armor combat box, you had to write out their full stats for and what they had where. Uh, and that's, here's why, because you had a nice cheat sheet. So this cheat sheet, again, there's a cardstock one in the modern box set of a game of armor combat um, that basically tracks all this stuff. But the only guns you had access to were small, medium, and large lasers, a PPC, LRMs, up to 20, SRMs, between two and six, autocannons, machine guns, and flamers. And there's only one size of autocannon, it looks like, ammo per shot. All that, I think, gets changed and added too quickly. But all of your stuff's in here, your piloting skill roll table, crit effect table. Uh, if you get hit in the head, one point of damage to the mech warriors per turn. Heat is 15 to 24. Uh, cockpit, mech warrior's dead, mech's out of the game. <laughs> Sensors, first hit, you get plus two to your firing thing, and then second hit, you can't shoot your guns anymore. Yeah, it's amazing how little it's all changed. And then here you go, so these are your mech train. They do fill them out for you for the chameleons. So the idea was you'd pop the box, you'd photocopy two of these, if you had that, or I guess in 85 you'd mimeograph them on the mimeograph machine with a big crank. <laughs> People probably don't even know what that is. Um, and then you would go off and play your first training games using like the first 10 pages of the rules in here. So it's funny because this, this almost combines the beginner set that's available now with the Game of Armored Combat set into one box back in 85. And then because it was the same sheets over, you had the cheat sheet and the blank sheet again. Then you could again mimeograph if you want to. Uh, and then the Linden's Company. More rules for granular stuff for partial cover. Prone max. Determining your damage value and recording your damage. How you destroy a mech. How it transfers through the systems. The Bandit Kings. Helmar Velasic, Bandit King of Santikar V. I don't know anything about them during the Succession Wars. Hendrik III, Rajak Ryan, Chieftain of the Butthold. <laughs> and the rules in here are for all your crit effects. So like your life support, legs blown off. I wonder if it's the same. 
Uh, so under combat resolution, you'd have critical effects causing damage. Is that a club attack? Yep, yeah, I'm gonna club that guy. Critical damage. Maybe the critical effects are later. Here we go, damage resolution. Yeah, so applying critical damage, transferring criticals. Yeah, there's some additional stuff in here like actuators, which don't exist yet. Um, but yeah, the cockpit, a critical hit of the cockpit kills Mech Warrior. Same as here. Your arm being blown off, left hit, leg blown off, uh, critical hit engine, uh, center torso, your gyro. You can hit your gyro still in the torso. Yeah, so little difference. Ammo criticals. If your Mech Warrior takes damage. And whether or not they can get knocked out. Destroying a max step-by-step -step damage and heat points. How to organize a battle my company, and then a quick ref for um, playing a game. This section of the rulebook contains the information needed to play expert battle lands. These rules assume the players have a working knowledge of the training in advanced gunnery games. New rules are provided here for the mech warriors who pilot the mechs and fire their weapons. The movement rules have been expanded to include falling down and getting up. The weapons attack rules have been expanded to include critical hits. And the physical attack rules have been expanded to include pushing and charging. Optional rules deal with the effects of weapons on terrain, including fires created by weapon attacks. So basically, those are your three levels. The game is the rule book is divided in three into um, your training, uh, your advanced gunnery, and then expert Battlelands player. And so it's the same game sequence. And so this would be like the full game, and it also gives you physical construction like like background for how it works for Battle Mac. All the movement stuff kind of reprinted again. Charging, death from above attacks. Physical attacks, falling from above. More background like the temperature control and the repair of the battle max. How you can clear woods with fire in the optional rules. And how they heat you up and they can spread. And then battle max stats. So again, you can see here the battle max aren't their own sheets. They've given, they, they make you fill them out yourself, but it's just like what you would have and where it would be. So where all of your equipment would be located on your on your damage sheet, and you have to copy it over yourself into a blank sheet. <laughs> Fighting with a club? I knew it was in there. Clubs are in there. If your arm or leg is blown off, the limb is left lying on the ground, and mech that occupies that hex can pick it up and use it as a club. So for real, there's actually club attacks in here. See, look, club attacks. <laughs> so awesome. And then how to design a battle mech, which is also in here, so you can make your own mechs. That was, I think, a key feature of this becoming so popular. Now, there's no scenarios, really, but there are construction rules. And the only difference is you can't go below 10 tons. It's 20 tons base. Yeah, design the chassis. 20 tons base for this one. Internal structure, and then your engine comes later now. Yeah, there it is. There's the engine rating. So 20, it's 1.5. I think it's exactly the same. The only thing they've taken off is they've taken off all the, the names like Nissan and uh, GM. Because <laughs> it was all in there. You could actually, there were real life people making the engines. Determine your engine rating, your control systems, you apply your internal structure, can it jump, add extra heat sinks, add armor, add weapons and ammunition, and complete the equipment tables. And so the, the original mechs that are in this are, <clears throat> there's 14 of them. And it's the Archer, the Shadowhawk, the Chameleon is the training mech, the Marauder and the Thunderbolt. The Wasp, Wolverine, Phoenix Hawk, Rifleman, Locust and Crusader, Battlemaster, Griffin, Stinger and Warhammer. And they give you a filled out Merlin. So the Merlin's in here, it's just not pictured. It's a battle mech sheet. So if you wanted to play a Merlin, you could, but they use it as the example of like a homemade, homebrewed uh, battle mech. And that's it. Th those are the core rules. And again, another another edition of the cheat sheet on the back here that you could photocopy. So little difference in 40 years. It's amazing. It's I, I think, honestly, it's a testimony to how passionate the fans of Battletech are um, and the people creating it now at Catalyst Game Labs that the game is largely unchanged, even though it's basically changed owners because it's gone from FASA to TOPS and it's now licensed to Catalyst. Um, so many times. It's been turned into video games. It's been turned into 
um, you know what I mean, like a, a, a whole bunch of like different properties, like a click game. Uh, over the last 40 years, it's got a new fast play mass combat system. But this core simulation, big stompy slow robots moving on a hex map. And those hex map games, you have to understand when I was a kid, those were the games my grandpa and my uncle played. These hex driven Avon Hill World War II resource management games. They were very popular. They were called card and counter uh, war games. This was a science fiction version of that. And the models came kind of as a secondary afterthought from FASA for when they got Ralpartha. And yeah, and it's turned into a miniature game. Like the free flowing miniature game you watch me play on the channel um, is just an adaptation of this core game. It's almost identical 40 years later almost. And I think that's something. So congratulations Battletech. You are the, I would say, longest contiguously running rule set in the history of Wargaming. Even Warhammer is so vastly different today than it was back in the 80s when it was first sort of like conceived or in the 70s when it was, you know, sort of originally like forming out of D&D and Chainmail um, that you can't really call it. You, it's a contiguous property, but it's not a contiguous rule set. And Battletech has been almost unchanged for four, almost four decades, uh, which I think is something of an accomplishment. It's 38 years old this year. Uh, if you count Battle Droids, which we should. I know I made a bunch of a big deal about the fact that it was Battle Droids, not Battle Duck, and this is versus Battle. It's just the first time it's called that ever, which meant uh, I think it was a fair comparison. So yeah, there it is. The I would say the uh, the most hardcore rule set in the history of wargaming rule sets. Although there are others out there uh, that are still technically in print that are almost as old or maybe as old. Uh, throw some in the comments if you can think of them. I'm thinking of things like. Mm, they'd mostly be like historicals or like hard sci-fi games. Things like Ogre. I think Ogre's pretty similar still. Uh, I don't know how old Hammer Slammers is, but it's a pretty old rule set too. And they, they've remained fairly unchanged for, for many decades as well. But Battletech, I think, is the reigning champ just as far as like, if you want to go critical success to uh, contiguous rules and yeah. What a, what a story, man. So I'm so glad I found this old copy of it. I hope you enjoyed this Throwback Thursday review. Until next time, I'm Ash. Have a good night. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video. There are tons of other games all recorded for you to watch. Click over to my channel page if you haven't already and have a look to the dozens of playlists full of videos. I guarantee you'll discover a game you haven't seen played before. I put out new videos seven days a week and every day is themed to a different genre as I continue to explore the wider world of gaming. Of course, none of that's possible without you, the viewer, so click a like and subscribe if you'd like to stay on top of what's happening here daily. My two kids and I are massively grateful to be able to have the flexibility of this job so I can always maximize my time with them. If you want to support me continuing to put out this content, it's only possible because of my amazing backers on Patreon who support the studio, equipment, and model cost, as well as being how I make the bulk of my living. You can also help out by buying a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, a measuring gauge or widget from Death Ray Designs, or buying one of my games and supplements, like Last Days, Gamma Wolves, and Blaster. As a way of showing my appreciation, patrons get early access to new games and supplements that I write throughout the course of the year. Huge thanks for watching, it really does help out, and happy gaming.